Family Talk. Murray Langdon on CFAX 1070. We've been having great discussions here in British Columbia and in Canada at large talking about the future of education and what that looks like. Here in BC, there's been an approach suggested or mused about that would be the direction to follow. And that's having more of an, uh, an individualized or a personalized uh, learning program established for students, practically right when they get into the system. And we're also talking about how technology may be able to play a greater and greater role as part of that. So I think it's important that we have this discussion to not only talk about how the system sits now, but what our potential is and how the students of the future will learn. Joining us for a discussion from Detroit, Michigan, Dr. Dr. Michael Barber, Assistant Professor at Wayne State University. Michael, great to have you on the program today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, education is key for any country. I mean, it's one of those core components of a functioning and a prosperous society. How would you estimate the, how we're doing in North America as it stands? I mean, overall, are we doing enough or is there greater capacity here? Um, well, if you expand it to North America, the, the answer could take pretty much your entire afternoon, um, or at my afternoon, your entire morning. Um, but if we just look at Canada, I think we're leveraging technology fairly well. Um, there are obviously some connectivity issues that we need to address, particularly in our rural and remote communities. Um, access to technology in some schools isn't as great as what I think we would like it to be. But when I look at what's going on around the world in this area, we're not behind by any stretch of the imagination. I think that we're at par and in some areas leading, quite frankly. Where do we have room for growth or expansion? Um, well, I guess it, it depends on, on specifically what you're looking at. Um, you know, one of the areas, obviously, that you're seeing a, a fair amount in the news to these days simply because of the Apple announcement a couple of days ago, but digital textbooks, is, is this area of, you know, essentially all these paper books that we have lying around and the potential to do so much more with them if you could somehow put them into an electronic format, um, not just in terms of the fact that you could replace eight or ten books with one simple device, but um, the fact that you know a paper textbook is limited in very many ways, one of which is that the second that it's printed, it's pretty much out of date, whereas you can update electronic material pretty much well, on demand. In addition to that, there's a lot more interactive features that could be built in. So that would be a, one area I would look at. Um, another area would be how we use online learning um, across the, the country, not just online learning, but what they're calling in the U.S. blended learning. And I say what they're calling in the U.S. blended learning because uh, essentially what it is, it's the use of online activities in a face-to-face -face classroom, which for us, north of the 49th parallel, we just see that as good technology integration in the classroom and things that our teachers have been doing really for two decades. It's almost kind of your old hat, no? Um, I'd say it is, yes. I mean, it's a new label. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have heard of blended learning four years ago, and, and there are political reasons that are sort of driving it in the U.S. that I don't see happening here in Canada. But uh, we're doing some of that now, and I think that's really an area where I think we could grow a lot more. But that goes hat in hand with the ability to have some kind of device in front of, of every student and the ability to have our schools connected at a very high rate. Um, in terms of, of you know the the speed that they can access the internet, uh, this is not to say that you know these devices would replace what goes on in the classroom. Um, you know the teacher plays a an important and a uh, you know role that simply can't be replaced, but it can enhance what the teacher can do, and for that matter, it can ex extend what the teacher can do with their students if the students have access to these this kind of technology. Absolutely, they're a very valuable accessory, but it certainly by no means replaces. That, that that instruction. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, Michael, you played a key role in, in a report, State of the Nation, K-12 Online Learning in Canada. Talk about this report and, and what you were looking at in order to give an overall assessment. Um, well, essentially, this is a, an annual study that we've been doing for the last four years. It, it tends to get released each oc late October, early November. Um, so the most recent one would have come out in, in November 2011. Um, what we specifically look at is the, the level of K-12 distance education that's going on on a province by province, territory by territory basis, and also the regulatory or structural regimes that are put in place in each of those jurisdictions that in some cases encourage um, growth and in other cases uh, hinder growth. Although I have to be honest with you, where we are right now, I, I don't see a lot of, of 
specific legislation that I think or specific regulations that are really hindering growth. I mean, with any sort of new, emerging, innovative technology, there are always tweaks that can be made to the way in which things are, are, are done. But I don't see anything that's really preventing us from expanding in this area right now. I have to notice that I was uh, fascinated in looking at a, at a nationwide breakdown. British Columbia really seems to be uh, either an early or uh, a prolific adopter of online learning potential, it seems. Um, I'd say both, actually. Um, BC was one of the, the first, actually, if you trace sort of the history of online schooling, um, the first online schools appeared in British Columbia in 1993, at least based upon the, the data that we've been able to collect. Um, now, many other provinces followed suit very quickly, um, literally within two years. So there were seven provinces that were doing this. Um, but one of the things that you've got in British Columbia, British Columbia actually has the most structured uh, regulatory regime in Canada. And one of the things that I think has encouraged growth in BC so much is the fact that the funding for students in British Columbia is cut up based upon the courses that they do so that the funding follows the student depending on where they're getting their education. So if you had a student, say they do on average six courses um, in a given year, um, they actually cut the, the funding for the student into seven pieces. Um, say this student might be doing four classes in the classroom and two classes online. The, student, the school that's offering, you know, that's hosting that student, that physical school, they would get four-sevenths of the funding for the four classes that they're offering to that student. The online school gets two-sevenths of the funding for the two courses that they're offering. And then because the student is still going to be in that physical school, um, you know, they're going to be at a computer somewhere, they still have to be supervised in some way, um, you know, the lights are still on, the electricity is still going to the computer, um, the school gets another one-seventh to help offset the cost of still providing that in, that in loco parentis, that in place of the prudent parent role um, for that student. In your estimation, how crucial is that funding formula? Um, well, in all honesty, I would say that is the reason that British Columbia is leading the country in, in um, activity. And, and just to give your listeners some context, um, this past year, BC had about 13.5% of its K-12 students that were enrolled in one or more distance courses. I was actually taken aback by that number, especially when you stack it up against the rest of Canada. Well, the national average is 4.2. Yeah. So BC is three times the, the 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 rest of the country, and the closest one to them are actually Manitoba at 5%. So they're more than double their closest person. But they're also the only jurisdiction that has this kind of funding arrangement. Um, and I think that's critical because what it allows, it allows a student, or for that matter, the student in conjunction with their parents, to sort of sit down and say, you know, is there a better way for me to learn this particular subject? Or is there a specific course that I'm interested in and passionate about that I can't get at my own school that maybe I could get online? And it's not a matter of having to go to the school principal and try to negotiate getting into the course and whether or not the school is going to allow it and whether or not they'll support it and do they do it begrudgingly and that kind of thing. It's just a decision that gets made and the funding automatically flows. When I think of, of the opportunity, because a lot of people will measure, you know, someone's success on on um, actual ha occupying a seat time. And I know there is a correlation. Generally, the more you attend class, on average, the better you do. But but there, I think with online learning, Michael, it's become clear, not everyone learns in the same fashion. And I think that's why we're starting to hear these greater discussions about what are our, our best approaches, not just what is our best approach, but what are our best approaches in plural. And I think online learning is a key component of that. Yes, and I mean, for certain students, it's an absolute necessity. You can think of, a, to use a student, uh, an example that they use in, in the U.S. a fair amount. You have a student, for example, that has um, autism or Asperger's syndrome or something like that, where, you know, they can't sit in a desk that's arranged in rows with a teacher in the front of the room and sit quietly for four or five hours during the day and get their education that way. Now, should that student be disadvantaged and not receive the same quality of education because, you know, they have a disability that simply doesn't allow them to conform with the way in which we've decided to offer education. You know, it's not for every student. 
uh, you know, I'd never want to see that that number sitting at 100 percent because I don't think, regardless of how well we can design online learning and how well we can deliver and support it, I don't believe that it is the answer for every student. But there are a lot of students out there that could benefit from one more or even all of their courses being offered in some kind of alternate format, and online learning could be one of those things.